Hello and welcome to Amagi, co-hosted by myself, Nima Majur of EconomicsJunkie.com and Dylan Moore of the Volitional Science Network, which you can find on YouTube. We are here to tackle ideas both ancient and modern in an effort to bring you the tools needed to expand the power of your worldview, making you a more potent entity professionally, politically, philosophically or otherwise. We are graciously being hosted by the Think Liberty Network, which you can find at think liberty Com. This is episode 28, the MMT criticism strike back. All right, Dylan, why don't you take it away with the first uh, article that we came across? Yeah, so we got three articles here. I'm not sure if we're going to get through all three of them, but we got two more from the uh, FFE, which is the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, it's FEE. What did I say? FFE. Well... Maybe I should be getting some other education somewhere else. Anyway, FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education, which wrote a pretty silly MMT article last time we, we covered this. By the way, I just want to point out, it seems like somebody gave the FFE an order to pump out MMT hit pieces. Because they are we just, pumping them out. They are just pumping yeah, them out. If, if you look for uh, on their website uh, under the topic MMT, if you just type in FEE space MMT in Google, you'll come across exactly three articles. And those are the ones that they've been writing over the past uh, three days. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, two weeks or three weeks, maybe. So, yeah, they're, they're, they've been busy typist monkeys type, typing out or pumping out MMT hit pieces. Yeah, and it's going to be pretty monkey, as you guys are about to see. And then the, the third one is another one by Colin Roche. <laughs> Uh, he's, uh, the writer at, uh, pragmatic capitalism, pragcap.com, which is quite a bit better. We're going to see where we disagree with them, but quite a bit better than these FFE ones. <laughs> I said it again, FEE ones. So anyway, I'm going to get into the first article, which is titled modern monetary theory is a recipe for hyperinflation. The link will be below. So it opens saying, even if politicians could perfectly plan the economy, humans would still respond to natural incentives, making MMT an impossible economic scheme. Nima, do you, do you smell a straw man being set up? I don't know how many fallacies I'm smelling in this one, <laughs> but yeah, there's a straw man, there's a non sequitur, um... It's probably that was pretty packed. Other. That was pretty packed. Yeah. So the latest fashion fashion that's captured the political left is modern monetary theory. MMT. Once a quiet idea resting in the annals of academia, it is now taking up by the likes of Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders advisor Stephanie Kelton. It's still an unpopular theory among economists and for good reason. Poisoning the well. God, yeah, I was just going to, should we just, well, like, instead of talking about economics, should we just do a trivium show? Yeah. And just go over fallacies? I mean. One day. Well, uh, I, I, I mean, on these articles. Yeah. What were we going to say? Well, I think we just end up doing that naturally anyway. Y you gotta. Considering well, all the fallacies out there. Right. So, I mean, and, and then let's let's do it a little bit here. So, so far, we haven't actually heard anything about what MMT says or purportedly says. And we've already been hit that it's a fashion. It, it was once a quiet idea, like back in the dustbins of academia. And now it's being taken up, but it's still unpopular among economists. Again, the impl uh, uh, implication that someone like Stephanie Kelton isn't a, an economist. Right. So going on. Okay. MMT extrapolates from a series of, an, of accounting identities with reckless abandon. Dude, I think you extrapolate non-arguments with reckless abandon. Yeah. By leveraging America's infinite ability to print its own currency, MMTers think they can sidestep the need to balance budgets. I don't know if I've ever met an MMTer that thinks that. They are wrong. Modern monetary theory is one of those ideas that mathematically holds together, holds together, but utterly fails once you've incorporated actual economics, 
We right, ne- no quote, no quote so far from any MMT advocate, from any MMT literature, any book, any paper. Nothing. Just yeah, just an imaginary argument that he's uh, debunked. I guess. So uh, we got a subtitle coming up next. It says how monetary policy now works. To understand how MMT fails, it's important to understand how it should work. Um, what? So this is under how mon- how monetary policy now works. And then we say to understand how MMT fails, it's important to understand how it should work. Should being MMT? Beginning with the system, it yearns to replace conventional monetary policy. So... Anyone who's looked at MMT for five minutes knows that it's not trying to replace anything. Yeah, it just recognizes uh, the system as is and has existed for 5,000 plus years. And then even if you're going to make the argument that it's an incorrect description of the monetary system, it is fallacious. We're going to be using that word a lot tonight, I can tell. To uh, say it this way, which is it's yearning to replace something, it's not. So he goes on. Here's how monetary policy works now. If a central bank, such as the U.S. Federal Reserve, the Fed, thinks interest rates should be lower to encourage economic growth, it creates money at the push of a button. No. Well, let's let's hear what he has to say. It yeah. uses this newly created money to buy government bonds from private banks. These banks, now flush with cash, are willing to lend at a lower interest rate, encouraging consumption and investment. Okay, oh take it God. away, Nima. <laughs> what, what nonsense. What, what complete nonsense. So the way banks lend has nothing to do with how many bonds the Fed has purchased from them. A bank makes a loan... When it finds a willing and able borrower, that's how banking works. And um, the Fed does buy bonds, in particular short-term bonds, to uh, to drive down the interest rate or sells bonds to drive up the interest rate that is charged on reserves. But there's no need to do that. They could technically just uh, declare a one stable interest rate and keep it at that. Uh, Lowering interest rates does not encourage economic growth. Uh, I mean, he basically lists all the cliches of of mainstream uh, corporate media idiocy that is pumped out regularly to confuse the public. But what he's stating in this paragraph uh, has even uh, there's lots of MMT critics would agree with me here that this is uh, economic illiteracy that he's um, promoting here. Um, the Let's just go through it here. Okay. Sure. If it uses the newly created money to buy government bonds from private banks. These banks, now flush with, with cash, are willing to lend at a lower interest rate. Uh, yeah, you don't even know where to start, do you? <laughs> yeah, because if uh, so, he doesn't know, know the first thing about a, a reserve banking and um, inter interbank reserves and how this entire banking system works. Basically, if the Fed buys bonds from banks and those banks are now flush with with cash, which would be bank reserves, th- that would immediately drive the interbank lending rate below the Fed's desired rate, which is why the Fed would sterilize whatever money has been injected immediately by selling short-term bonds into the system. So this is one thing that people oftentimes don't consider when it comes to quantitative easing. The money that's injected generally, the the, the reserves that are injected are generally uh, pulled out of the economy again by necessity, because the Fed has declared a rate and uh, 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 determined to is determined to maintain that rate. What does lower the interest rate is when the Fed declares a lower rate and enforces that rate in its uh, interbank operations. But it's got nothing to do 
with the bank willing to lend at a lower rate or any such no, there's no such mechanism right well and then just to finish the thought that you had earlier when you said that the way lending works is when a ready and able borrower comes along the bank creates it out of thin air just as much as the fed does yeah and yeah, the, bank, the bank now flush with cash it's just not how it works the bank doesn't lend because it's suddenly flush with cash the bank lends Whenever it finds a willing and able borrower. And the cash slash the reserves are required by the bank simply because it's a well, regulatory requirement. There's a regulatory requirement. There's also uh, some reserves that they need to hold for, for interbank, for tax payments and for interbank clearing. So those, but if even if they are short on those, they can always borrow them at the interbank le- uh, lending rate. Uh, from other banks or in last resort from the Fed. And there's certainly no need for them to just hold reserves to be flush with them. And if they ever were, they would immediately try to get rid of the reserves because it's a very uneconomic investment. Yeah, they're not and making them any money. No. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. If the central bank fears inflation because there's too much money in the system, it sells government bonds to banks and deletes the money it collects. It should be noted that figuring out how much money to create or delete in order to achieve the delicate balance of stable prices and economic growth is very difficult. And there's a hyperlink for is very difficult. I'm assuming there's a, another article talking about why that's difficult. But yeah, this is just the flip side of his fallacy here. Now he says that if inflation goes high, then the bank just needs to um, sell bonds into the system and and thus withdraw money from the system, and that will stop inflation. Except there's no empirical evidence for any such causality or mechanism. We've had incredibly high interest rates throughout the 70s, progressively going higher and higher, and inflation uh, did not stop. In fact, inflation just started going higher and higher, and. Inflation stopped when the U.S. uh, deregulated the price for natural gas, which uh, constituted a uh, formidable competition to oil. And so the oil embargo was, you know, less powerful than it was beforehand. But also Warren Mosler, as we've discussed many times, has actually pointed out that raising the interest rate might actually cause more inflation than it prevents. Because it's net introducing more yeah. money into the system so what this guy is in fact outlining here is the prevailing mythology on how money and banking work and the prevailing myth that is propagated by you know the media and whoever deems it helpful to confuse the public about these topics including this uh, author i guess The next subtitle, Money, Money, Everywhere. MMT transfers these difficult monetary decisions to Congress. It does? The Fed still creates money. Oh, I see. This is, in quotes, what MMT wants to do. The Fed still creates money, but Congress, by passing legislation, determines how much they create. New money doesn't flow through the banks, but through the recipients of, of various spending programs. Now, MMT is pointing out that this is already the case in, in, in the sense that Congress is the one determining how much money to spend. Yeah, how much uh, net financial assets Correct. are injected into the economy basically through deficit spending, which is already happening. It's not something new or something that MMT has invented. Yeah. Inflation is the natural concern of this money creation, and MMTers have an answer. Taxes. In the MMT world, taxes are not used to raise money for future spending. Taxes are used to destroy money to balance out previous spending. Tax revenue collected is money deleted. Um, Yeah, this is uh, basically MMT points out that fiscal policy is the mechanism that does all these things that mainstream uh, mythology and monetarism suggests the Fed does, which they think the Fed injects money by buying bonds, which is just a private sector asset swap with no real big effect on inflation spending. And it 
drains money from the system by selling bonds, which is just another private sector swap. Rather insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Now, what actually creates spending and income and or destroys spending and income is if the federal government deficit spends money into the economy, which creates income, or accumulates surpluses, which deletes income from the private sector. So he basically just um, uh, goes through this uh, mechanism that MMT explains, which, you know, in, in, in essence... It's, yeah, it's uh, true. It's correct, yeah. It's true in essence. Um, I, I would uh, My one criticism is it is they say that... Uh, he's saying that MMTers say inflation is answered by taxes. I would say inflation is partially answered by taxes. Yeah, it can be. Uh, MMT says that if... That's an uh, option. Yeah, which we don't re- we're really in favor of. We just... Uh, we would prefer... I mean, by we, I say you and I are generally libertarian-minded people. We'd probably prefer if the government reduced its spending and not raised taxes. This well, is under. Uh, this is all in an eco- in a in a great economy, by the way, an economy that you and I ha- have probably never seen in our lives, and an economy that is right. the type of economy that Warren Mosler talks about, where you have full employment, companies are competing for uh, uh, employees. And resources are fully utilized. And that kind of scenario, which we're far away from, you could uh, start seeing high inflation. And that scenario, taxes or reducing government spending, would uh, reduce the inflation. The inflation that's caused by this excess demand. Right. And then uh, one thing to reemphasize here, we've, we've emphasized this in other videos specifically on this topic, is that Money supply is not the only thing that can contribute to inflation. And in fact, uh, there's evidence to support the fact that it's not really that big of a contributor. Yeah, Yeah, we've discussed this before. Inflation is, uh, according to MMT at least, inflation is caused by the sum of, in in a full resource employed, in a fully employed economy. And by fully employed, I mean that the resources that money is being spent on are fully employed. So in such an economy, inflation is pushed up by the sum of deficit spending plus export surpluses plus investment spending. I'm going to keep moving on. Yeah. In an interview with NPR, Kelton likens the economy to a sink. The money supply is like water flowing from the faucet, which in the MMT world is spending. I like how he keeps throwing in, in the MMT world, in, yeah, in Bizarro world, this is how things work. Yeah, dude, it's not, it's not that strange of a metaphor here, man, or a, a simile. If there's too much water, the sink overflows, inflation, but have no fear. The government's ability to tax is like the drain. As long as money is flowing in from the faucet is balanced by money flowing out through the drain, there's no inflation. The result is limitless funding with no downside. How is that the result? Straw man. (laughs) What? Complete straw man. Okay. I'm I'm just sure. If you think that's too good to be true, you're right. Yeah, because it's a straw man. Once you've considered actual incentives, man. But once you've considered the actual incentives... It's clear that implementing modern monetary theory doesn't avoid hyperinflation at all. (laughs) The actual incentives. The actual incentives, Nima. I'm not going to tell you what they are. (laughs) I'm just going to say the actual incentives. And what's the hyperinflation problem? I I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Subtitle. The faucet is stuck and the drain is clogged. There's a reason modern economies establish a firewall between their elected officials and their central bank. They don't. Printing money to fund spending is much more politically tempting than raising that money with taxes. Well, we've already discussed that raising money doesn't or uh, collecting taxes isn't raising money for spending. And he didn't address the fact he he didn't give an argument why that's not the case. A a sovereign government does not need to raise money to be able to spend money. A sovereign government 
declares a tax in the sovereign government's token and then spins the sovereign government token into existence and taxes some of that out of existence later on. Politicians have little incentive to restrain spending. I, I agree. Well, and actually, I I half agree. Yeah. I, th- I think the politicians' greatest incentive to restrain spending is to attack the opposing political party. Where, yes. Where we if, see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if, if I'm a Democrat and I don't like the Republicans, I'm going to uh, start bitching about the budget as soon as they want to pay for something that I don't like and vice versa. Well, a great example is the Republicans under Obama who suddenly started throwing a giant tantrum, started this whole Tea Party movement because uh, the the spending was just – deficits were out of control and they had to put a stop to that. And all of a sudden now – It's the other way around. The Republican president is running absolute record deficits and they don't have a problem with that at all. Well, And the Democrats are talking about, oh, this reckless spending. We can't afford a wall. It's a waste of money. Whatever. Right. Spending gener- generates political benefits in the short term before the election at long term cost after the election. Yeah, I mean, there's truth to that. There's an endless number of ways to spend money. And as evidenced by persistent government deficits, every incentive for the politician to fulfill those requests. It would be naive to assume that politicians would will restrain their spending even if they know they should. They already don't. I'm not sure what point he's criticizing here. Nor is well. He's uh, he's attacking the straw man argument that there's no limitation to spending in the MMT ah, world. Got it. Nor is there reason to assume politicians will raise taxes to balance their spending. I think there's plenty of reason to assume that the politicians will raise taxes for any goddamn reason. Politicians are always raising taxes. Taxes remain wildly unpopular. Uh, despite the fact that Nancy Pelosi, who is in third in line to become the president if people started dying, is openly out there saying that she wants to increase taxes. And for some reason, she still maintains her position. Taxes remain wildly unpopular. Their presence can even derail support for popular policies. For example, support for Medicare for all plummets when pollsters note that it would come with higher taxes. Uh, it doesn't have to. As MMT will point out, not that I'm for Medicare for all, but it doesn't need higher taxes to implement taxes to fight the distant and abstract concept of inflation will surely be even less popular. Why would any politician increase taxes to fight a problem voters have trouble even acknowledging? Yeah, so don't. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to increase taxes, right? Even if an MMT regime, MEMA. Oh, my God. Are you going to start an MMT regime? Is this uh, a regime? Is this going to be run by Warren Mosler Pinochet or something like that? (laughs) Even if an MMT regime reliably uses taxes to fight inflation, it would be completely impractical. Impractical. I like how he harps on the using tax to fight inflation. Something that MMTers don't even really find all that important. But yeah, okay. the so, Fed. And, well, and then listen to what he says next. The Fed meets eight times a year to evaluate, evaluate how it would adjust the growth of money for the money supply. And, it and does then, actually. <laughs> it meets to adjust the interest rate. It doesn't control you, the money supply. It doesn't even look at the money supply as a, an indicator. But this is the funny part I wanted to laugh about. He said, he says an MMT government would have to do something similar about its taxes and spending. So if taxes are the thing to fight inflation, he says it's impractical, impractical because a government might have to meet eight times a year to talk about it. <laughs> I don't know what this guy's doing in his spare time where eight times a year is like over the top. <laughs> we would never stop talking about taxes. Well, that's kind of already the case. The 2017 tax reform took months to negotiate and incorporated a menagerie of conflicting interests, each pulling the tax code to a preferred policy outcome, expecting lawmakers to act to carefully consider how much money they're leaving in the economy is ludicrous. Yeah, I mean, there's some truth to that, too. I don't expect any lawmaker to not be 
a narcissistic asshole. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you could just flip this argument back around where you could say, okay, well, this already exists, so how about we acknowledge what's actually real in the economy and, you know, bring this government fight over something that's real. We have all the, the conflicting interests pulling at each other, but at least they're pulling at each, at, at each other over the way things actually work. <laughs> The myopic attitude of politicians is why strong economies establish central bank independence. Really? Countries <laughs> countries that subject the power to printing wait, wait, countries that subject the power to printing money to political pressure. Wait, is this a correct sentence? Countries that that subject the power to printing money. I think he means of printing money. Countries yeah. that subject the power of printing money to political pressure inevitably create price instability. Under modern monetary th- theory, we'll end up with the same result we have now. Spending will far outstrip taxes. Good. But now for the hyperinflation. But now with hyperinflation. Oh, yeah, so, th- okay. Now with hyperinflation. That's his coup de gras. This is kind of like playing rock, paper, scissors, uh, chainsaw, laser robot. <laughs> uh, no matter what we're talking about in economics, Nima, all I have to say is hyperinflation and you lose. Yes. Yeah. Briefly, I mean, we've discussed this so many times, but um, hyperinflation is not caused by a government that spends too much money. Hyperinflation has historically always been caused by very disastrous political events. Example, Weimar Germany, uh, post-World War One, Germany defeated on its knees, destroyed. The French invading on the uh, west uh, side and forcing Germans to produce coal at gunpoint. And uh, Germany owing of, taxes in yeah. uh, currency that it couldn't produce. Treaty of Versailles having imposed an, an, an impossible sum of money to pay in gold marks. So the entire productive capacity of Germany was uh, uh, leached and siphoned off from. And uh, so nothing was left for the domestic private sector. So that's reflected in rising prices. And then we have Zimbabwe, which had a disastrous land reform. The uh, land was just taken away from white farmers, distributed to uh, uh, other factions, Bandits. mostly raided, raided for scraps. And well, I mean, the white farmers were natives. No, no, I, I mean, the, yeah, the people raided them for scraps. That's why I'm calling them bandits. Oh, bandits. Yeah, that's so what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the production collapsed. If you have fewer goods, then you have uh, – if product, productive capacity co- collapses, generally speaking, that's when you usually see hyperinflation. Got nothing to do with monetary policy or fiscal policy even. Subtitle. There is no infinite power to tax. Oh, we, ha- we have another example. We, we, of <laughs> course, we have countries like – Venezuela right now, which is uh, obviously has a collectivist economy, which, which um, just lots of lights productive. But also, what what I ha- what we haven't talked much about Venezuela, which we should be talking more about, is the sanctions that have been imposed from Venezuela from all sides, from the international co- and the globalist uh, establishment. Uh, that would probably be an interesting topic to cover because I have a suspicion that 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 is a huge factor in Venezuela's hyperinflation. Yeah, where there's if, if they can't produce their own stuff they can't, and they can't import it either, there's nothing to buy. Right. There's, there, there are no resources to utilize. Right. So, uh, subtitle, there is no infinite power to tax. Even if somehow the political will to use taxes to offset spending is achieved. He doesn't stop. <laughs> well, you don't... Stop you, you talking don't, about taxes, man. I, I, I was... <laughs> The, the reason I'm kind of able to get this dramatic voice to go along with this is because he's using really dramatic language and it's fitting. So even if somehow the political will to use taxes to offset spending is achieved, I'm kind of doing a William Shatner, aren't I? The governance, government's infinite ability to create is not matched by an infinite ability to destroy. Taxes are avoidable. 
something Canada has recently rediscovered. So the government's ability to reduce the money supply through taxes is actually quite constrained. And by taxes are avoid- avoidable, he, had, he has a hyperlink here to another article. And I, th- I think it has to do with the fact that people will try to avoid taxes and do things under the table. Or, you know, reclassify what they're doing as some other tax category in order to avoid the taxes. So, therefore, the government can't collect them. You know, this guy is just somehow, he he doesn't know anything about MMT. So, he's just started, he shifted to t- talking about taxes. Yep. And how difficult it is to tax and taxes, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, let's go on. High taxes generate little revenue because high taxes reduce the incentive to do what is, whatever is taxed. I agree. It's much yep. like how high prices reduce revenue by discouraging customers. Totally agree. <laughs> a high t- income tax discourages working. A high sales tax dis- discourages buying. And a high capital gains tax discourages investment. High taxes can even uh, move activity to the untaxable informal sector, a phenomenon common in underdeveloped countries, that under the, i.e. under the table. There's a limit to how much the government can tax out of the economy. Man, if the government really wants the money, they get it. Give me a break. <laughs> Especially in, in a modern country, right? It's like, oh, yeah, uh, they, uh, they'll just hide all the money from being taxed. Yeah, they might hide some, hide some of it, but, I mean, they'll, they'll get a lot of it if they want a lot of it. And particularly, if, if they really want it, they'll just do a property tax. Because then you don't have to chase the person or the bank account down. Yeah. There's, uh, I, I still maintain that he's not talking about MMT right now. He, yeah. He's, uh, he's just going out he's, about He's taxes. been given a quota of words to type. He knows nothing about MMT. He saw something about taxes to fight inflation, and, and he got super excited about that. And now he's lecturing us on complete trivial truisms. Okay, I'll, I'll blast through this tax part then. Yeah. Consider taxes on the rich, which are typically the most popular kind. The rich don't need an additional income as much as the poor, which is both the reason people like taxing them and why taxing them doesn't raise much revenue. The rich can easily easily retire early, turn down work, and demand forms of non-monetary and thus untaxable compensation. I have... What the fuck is this guy talking about? You can't balance unlimited spending by only taxing groups that are best at avoiding taxes. Like, are, is he refining straw men? He, he went from taxing everybody to the fact that uh, we're only ta- now we're only taxing rich people. Since you can't balance unrestrained money creation by only taxing the rich, see... See how that shifted? That th- them was some moving goalposts, boy. Since you can't balance unrestrained money creation by only taxing the rich, politicians will be forced to fight inflation with higher taxes for everyone else, threatening to cancel out the benefits government spending sought to impart. <laughs> Just like the rich, everyone else will respond accordingly. Voters will demand more spending, and special interests will want tax exemptions, even more than it does now. Federal spending will epitomize Bastiat's insightful description of government, the great fiction through which everyone endeavors to live at the expense of everyone else. Spending will be high, tax revenue destruction will be low, inflation, and then hyperinflation will follow. Chainsaw laser (laughs) robot! (laughs) Chainsaw laser robot, I win! Okay, so just briefly, we're you and I. We are advocates of MMT. We've never argued that the rich should be taxed. We've never argued that sales taxes should be increased. We've never talked about a property tax. Never talked about raising taxes. MMT doesn't promote raising taxes. MMT says that the government deficit needs to be sufficient to support the private sector's uh, net financial asset um, accumulation. And that can happen through tax cuts or through raising spending. Those are the things that we've talked about. So he's he's attacking the opposite of what MMT promotes, in other words. Well, I mean, if you're going to project, like, yeah, if you're gonna go strong to the walls. Uh, might, might as well, exactly. Okay, uh, ending statement here. A House and Senate of Cards. Uh, 
Modern monetary theory advocates argue governments have monetary policy exactly backwards. Taxes don't fund spending, they say. Spend first and use taxes to fix it later. No, we've never said that. (laughs) They forget that tax revenue doesn't fund spending now. Correct. We do say that as evidenced by persistent government deficits. If taxes can't offset spending when politicians are supposedly constrained, taxes won't offset spending when politicians are explicitly handed the power of the printing press. Implementing MMT, which doesn't make any sense, even seriously discussing implementing MMT would create a disaster that no plumber could fix, drowning us all in a tidal wave of hyper of chainsaw laser robot. (laughs) (laughs) Like he, he really, he's really excited about his uh, hyperinflation discovery. There, yeah. it seems. he can't stop uh, talking about so it. So this is by David Youngberg, and this has already gotten fourteen hundred nineteen shares. Hey, uh, yeah, Youngberg. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next one. It's a little bit shorter. Unless, you, unless you had any final commentary on that, Nima. Okay, that's what I thought. So (laughs) the next one is titled Modern Monetary Theory Isn't Economics. MMT is a bait and switch. Let's let's do a bet. How how many times are they going to talk about hyperinflation? Use the word hyperinflation or just talk about it? Yeah, use the word. I'm going to say six. Okay, I'm going to say I'm going to say five. Okay. Oh, man, that's right next to mine. Okay, whatever. So MMT, and, and imagine how much this guy must be patting his himself on the back for how clever this statement is. MMT is a bait and switch wrapped in a sleight of hand. That's a good one. Oh. That's a clever one. Uh, I'm... I'm kind of it, it, it took two people to come up with this, apparently, because two people <laughs> had to write this article. By the way, what's up? I see this trend more and more on, on all these junk news sites like HuffPo, et cetera, where like every article is written by five people or two or three or four people. I, anyway. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. Do they all sit around and they have to like collectively come up? The, yeah, they like, have to words? type. Exactly. Put words together and then and then glue their <laughs> respective <laughs> stories together, I guess. Modern money theory, monetary theory, or MMT, is all the rage in the halls of Congress lately. More of this emotional language. God damn. To hear the progressive left tell it, MMT is not unlike a goose that keeps laying golden eggs. All we have to do is pick up the free money. This is music to politicians' ears, but Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is singing a decidedly different tune. Said Powell recently on MMT, the idea that deficits don't matter for countries that could borrow in their own currency is just wrong. Nima, tell me a list of all the MMT people that you know that have ever said deficits don't matter. Yeah, no such thing. Straw man. MMT advocates see this as outdated thinking. We can, they claim, spend as much as we want on whatever we want, unencumbered by trivialities like how much we have. But MMT is a bait and switch wrapped in a sleight of hand. And I am so proud of that statement. I, I made it bold and put it on the side of the article so you can read it again. The, the statement literally shows up three times. That's what we should have been on. Damn. Like, it's the tagline. It's a sentence here. And it's also highlighted right inside this paragraph. So <laughs> the uh, this is literally the opposite of MMT. W- Let's see. uh, MMT claims that we can spend as much as we want on whatever we want, unencumbered by trivialities like how much we have. That's the only thing MMT cares about is how much we have. Yeah. It focuses. And and it it only you can only say that shit if you've never read any MMT, if you've never talked to any MMT proponent, if you've never listened to any MMT people. And that's the problem with all these F double E articles that we're covering here. It seems like these people have been tasked with typing up a hit piece and, and and don't have the curiosity or patience or time to actually have a conversation with the MMT advocates that they're trying to, uh, attack. 
it focuses on debt and dollars rather than resources and products. Again, literally the opposite. That that is yeah. F- like yeah. flip that around, the, and that's the, the what he actually said. The mainstream focuses on debt and dollars all the time. They always say, "Oh my God, the deficit! The number is big. It's scary. The the national debt clock is, is ticking up. It's a big number. It's really scary." So that's on them, not on us. Once they start using scientific notation, I'll let them say it's a big number. So debt and dollars are merely tools we use to transfer ownership of resources and products, right? It's the resources and products that matter, Nima. Shuffling debt and dollars merely changes the ownership of resources and products. It doesn't create more. Wow. What a bombshell. Did he and, bold that one too? Oh, no. He, no. no. He's, he's that humble, I guess. Uh, we haven't had hyperinflation yet. I think we might, might lose this bet. He's just going to yeah, repeat that very, quote. Very disappointed, actually. He's just going to repeat that bait and switch and a sleight of hand thing over and over again. MMT inflates foreign currency. MMT begins with the government, in quotes, printing money. It's a good thing he put that in quotes or else I wouldn't know what he was talking about. There's more to it than that, but the effect is to create money that didn't exist before and to place it in the hands of the government. The government then uses that money to pay for things that politicians want. That's actually how the system works. Yeah, that's what, how it works right now. I'm, I'm not sure where he's going here. But other, but other things being equal, usually if somebody says that, you know there's a line of bullshit coming up. If things work in this exactly perfect universe I'm about to describe, then uh, I'm right. I'm sure you are. But other things being equal, if the money supply grows faster than the production of goods and services, inflation results. MMT advocates claim that the growth in the production of goods and services will probably be enough to counteract any inflationary effects there might be. Have MMTers ever said said that will probably be enough to counteract? Well, first of all, the money supply growth doesn't have anything to do with inflation. And MMT certainly states that If production outpaces or keeps up with the money supply, then inflation will be insignificant. That's a pretty mainstream statement, by the way. There's nothing uh, new or novel about that. Yeah, I was going to say, I I feel like I could turn on the news and get told that. Yeah. Growth in production and goods, growth in the production of goods and services averages about 2% a year. Other things constant, again, there's, you know, If we don't look at any other variable, we keep them all the same. The money supply would have to grow no faster than this to avoid inflation. Yeah, but but, but not not how it works. Not not how inflation works. Complete nonsense. Like we said earlier, inflation is caused by government deficits plus investment plus export surpluses. And then also, by the way, by commodity price uh, but by monopoly, commodity price increases, like OPEC or something like that, if it's very important to uh, commodities. But the money supply by itself is is an incredibly lousy measure for inflation. And you could see that in 2008 when the market was flooded with money or 2008 and the following years when the Fed bought a bunch of money. And we've also seen in Japan for like 40 years – money injected like crazy and inflation negative or very low and MMT explains these phenomena predicts and explains these phenomena perfectly the mainstream fails miserably at it which is one of the reasons why I started paying attention to MMT but the money supply is already growing at 6% per year and that's without any MMT shenanigans yeah (laughs) shenanigans Ah, okay. So here's the sleight of hand, Nima. I'm actually going to explain my really bad simile or metaphor. I didn't remember if there was a word like in there. MMT advocates say that we won't experience inflation because the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency. Who the fuck ever said that? Foreigners hold – I mean, seriously, did, did yeah, yeah. MMT ever say that? I've never heard that before. No. Foreigners hold lots of U.S. dollars. <clears throat> First, increasing the money supply – other things constant does create inflation. 
But when a reserve currency inflates, the pain gets spread around the world instead of being concentrated within one country. In short, MMT advocates believe our government should print money and let foreigners bear some of the inflation pain. No, they just haven't talked to MMT advocates, so they make shit up. That's all. Second, there's no law that says the U.S. dollar must be a reserve currency. The British pound was one, but has declined in value. Foreigners stopped holding it. Excuse me. The British pound was one, but as its value declined, foreigners stopped holding it. Foreigners will stop holding U.S. dollars, too, as their value declines. Well, no, they don't because the U.S. dollar's value has been declining for hundreds of years, and it doesn't really matter. It's not particularly important to its status as a reserve currency. They will they will uh, uh, stop holding U.S. dollars one day probably because one day probably China will be, be the world's largest economy. And one day probably Ch- – just based on its sheer size of people. And one day China will probably start freely floating its currency. When that is, we don't know. It could be decades uh, in the future. Those are characteristics of a reserve currency. The U.S. is the lar- by far the largest economy in the world right now. And so its currency is naturally the world's reserve currency. MMT will shift more money to the government. Here's the bait and switch. So we can can we count the fact that he said here's a sleight of hand and then later said he's here's the bait and switch as another repeat. Mm-hmm. OK, so we're yeah. at four. MMTers say that if inflation does become a problem, the government can simply raise taxes to soap up excess dollars. Here we go with this shit again. <laughs> In short, the they go- coordinated, they, <laughs> coordinated they attack. Up, yeah, they didn't find enough uh, words to write, so they, they looked at the other guy's sheet. <laughs> In short, the government would print money with one hand, buying whatever it wants, and causing inflation. It would then tax with the other, thereby removing dollars from the economy and counteracting the inflation. In the end, all that's happened is that the government has replaced goods and services that people want with goods and services that politicians want. I'm not going to explain how. I'm just going to say that's what happened. After a bout of MMT, we might have the same GDP and zero inflation. But what constitutes that GDP would have changed dramatically. Instead of having more cars and houses, we might have more tanks and border walls. (laughs) Border wall would be nice, actually, but... um... Did, Did they just hire... Yeah, I'll take the border wall. Did they just hire some fucking tweakers off the street to, like... T- smoke meth and start typing at a computer yeah because now the, his argument is basically really scary stuff is going to happen if you do MMT because I say so that's that's the sum total of it when called on the bait and switch uh, I think that's uh, 4.5 because we didn't see here slight ha- sleight of hand the MM- and, and who, who did he call on the bait and switch I don't know and who, and who gave him a response this is all in his head, you see. <laughs> He's having an Im- imaginary conversation. Well, that's, about that's what happens when you're tweaking out, man. You just see shit. Yeah. So yeah. when called on the bait and switch, the MMT response is that, as with the private sector, the government's decisions won't be flawless. If voters are displeased with fewer cars and more tanks, all they need to do is voice their displeasure. This response ignores nearly everything we know about human behavior in both the private and public sectors. Man, I'm, by the way, I, I'm, I'm uh, getting like secondhand high from the tweakiness coming off of this article. By the way, um, if I recall correctly, the U.S. government ha- has spent enough money on bombs and armaments to, to, ins- to destroy the entire world many times over, have even just in the past decade or two invaded one, two, three, four... Uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Libya. Um, isn't uh, Yemen quasi Tunisia, in there? Yeah, Yemen, they've helped. With the, isn't the, Somalia the quasi so, in there? I mean, <laughs> he, uh, the disaster scenarios that he's conjuring up are currently occurring under this system. And we're not seeing. Yeah. In the private sector, profit and loss feedback pushes business to correct errors. In the public sector, the motivation is simply to spend without constraint. Errors be damned. Yeah, there's some truth in that. Yeah. I'll agree with that. 
Uh, not surprisingly, progressives want you to believe that they have found a new way around the laws of economics and that their new path will allow politicians to spend as much as they like. This isn't economics. It's magic dressed up in techno jargon. Except we don't say that the politicians can spend as much as they like. We're saying a whole bunch of other things that they haven't covered in this article. So that was written by an Anthony Davis and a James R. Harrigan. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I bet, good I, job. Bet, I bet it's fun being a monkey at a typewriter. <laughs> okay, so after that brain burn, we are now going to move over to something a little more hearty and a little more nourishing, which is Colin Roche over at pragcap.com. Again, this link will be below. And this is the, titled The Shortest and Best MMT Primer You'll Ever Read. Now, considering that the only other MMT primer I've ever read was by Randall Ray, which was, I mean, it wasn't super long, but it was pretty long, and it was quite dry. Uh, he's probably right. Um, I don't want to criticize Ray too much, but damn, his writing is dry. Man, <laughs> oof. Um, so here we go. About 10 years ago, I wrote an MMT primer after first being introduced to the theory. I initially thought that the theory was coherent and operationally sound, but it turns out that I was wrong. In fact, my primer wasn't a complete primer because MMT is much more complex than I initially thought, and is also more wrong than I initially thought. Unfortunately, that primer was pretty popular because it was succinct. So popular that Paul Krugman picked it up. Oops. Anyhow, I removed that primer a long time ago, and over the course of the last 10 years, I still haven't seen a succinct primer, so there is still tons of confusion about the theory. In fact, almost every explainer is absurdly long, and most responses, some by famous economists, are wrong in b rather basic ways, probably because they haven't waded through the one million word explainers that exist. Hard to blame them. So here's my second crack at it. I am sure that the MMT people will hate it and start lots of fights on Twitter about it. So fun. Here we go. I agree. Let's have it. Modern monetary theory is a theory of economics. At least he's giving it the intellectual credit that it is a theory of economics instead of titling the article MMT isn't economics. MMT is a theory of economics that attempts to explain how sovereign currency issuing nations operate within the scope of the macro economy. They start with some fairly simple insights. Number one, the government is the monopoly supplier of cash, coins, reserves, and government bonds. Check, I agree. Number two, taxes must be paid and settled in these various forms of money. Therefore, all other forms of money, like deposits, are IOUs for the real thing, which are the things that the government issues. Check. So far, so good. Number three. Since the government is the issuer of these things, they do not need to obtain income from the private sector in order to be able to create these assets. In fact, they must make them available before the private sector can use them. In other words, the government spends first and taxes second. Again, I agree. And I, I want to pause for a second that I find it incredibly refreshing simply the, the nature of the way he's setting this up, where he's saying MMT is using these observations to describe economy. And we can get into now, which is what he's doing, whether these observations are correct or the what we draw from them are correct. But at least he's giving the benefit of the doubt and saying, OK, here's their actual observations. I read them. He <laughs> he makes it – even if he disagrees, he can make the he can make the case for MMT. Yes. Which is always important. Anyone who attacks some theory should be able to to defend that theory eloquently and competently. And that's exactly what, what Colin does. Number four. All of this means the government is not revenue constrained. It doesn't really need taxes or to issue bonds to finance anything. When the government wants to spend, it just cranks up the printing press. So in the eyes of MMT people, the way things are done now is pretty much all wrong and unnecessary. Now, this part, I'm not sure because it, he doesn't explain um, 
what MMT people see as what's being done now? Well, um, deficits are financed through bonds and and people talk about balancing the budget and that kind of stuff, I assume, is what he's referring to. Okay, so, so the interpretation of the way things are done now. Yes. Is all, okay, 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 I got it. Uh, I think we're at number five. One, two, three, four, five. So what constrains the government? It's not being able to obtain money that is problematic. It's creating so much money that it devalues existing money. In other words, inflation is the real constraint. Here's the first part I disagree with him. And, and I mean, he's close. But the real constraint, as I understand it, is the real resources. Yeah, but but inflation is the indicator for that. So he's absolutely right, in my opinion. Okay. I see where you're going. Number six. Importantly, if the government does not issue enough of these assets and the private sector cannot pay their taxes and cannot save in, in quotes, net financial assets. Seven. Further, when the government imposes taxes and regulations on the private sector, this causes unemployment or involuntary unemployment because people need to obtain government assets to pay their taxes. For more on this, watch this fun imagery of Warren Mosler describing how the tax system is like a room of government employees threatening to shoot you if you don't obtain Warren's business cards. And he links to that, and we'll link to it below because that's a it's a great explanation of how spending and taxation works. So after those seven points, he goes on to say, regarding some specific terms that cause a lot of confusion, the first one is government. Government in MMT means the central bank is consolidated into the treasury. I think this is super important because they were making this mistake in the two previous articles that the, the central bank is somehow independent from the government. <laughs> it's not. Except, except the chairman is appointed by the president and the Senate appoints the board of uh, the open market committee. And I mean, there's no private company that uh, meets those uh, uh, characteristics. I, I want to hit that real quick because I've had some people get in my face about this. So the the Federal Reserve pays property tax on where it's located, and you can't FOIA it. You can't use uh, the um, Freedom of Information Act on it. And I'm trying to remember if there was something else. And they were using this to prove that it's a private entity. And I mean well – the only, the only thing I can I can respond to that is well, the NFL doesn't pay property tax on any of its shit. Does that mean it's government? Yeah, I mean, the Fed may the, the, all this stuff com- comes down to n- there are nominal aspects that make it look like the Fed is a private entity, right? They're registered as a corporation. They uh, they have um, stocks and the banks hold shares in the, in the Fed. But there's an article I wrote a while ago going through all the different factors that constitute a public versus private characteristics. And there's just such an overwhelming amount of public characteristics that I think it's pretty obvious that the Fed is an entity of the U.S. government for all practical purposes. Oh, yeah. And uh, thank you for pointing that out. But And I want to – I remembered one other thing that I, someone was getting in my face about is this thing where nobody knows who owns it. It's it's public fucking record because it's yeah. all the, the whole thing about the stock per law, per the um, Federal Reserve Act. In order to be a bank, you must own stock in the Federal Reserve Bank. So the shareholders, they get paid the two percent of the profits that the Federal Reserve earns. And when people wonder, we don't know where all the profits to the Federal Reserve are going to these unknown stockholders. I'll tell you who they are. They're every single bank in the country, and they get 2% of the profits. It's the, not 2% of the profits. It's 2% of the money paid in, Thank you. I believe. It's like a preferred stock, essentially. It's like they're receiving perpetual interest on – these, you know, whatever amount, I don't know if you're a bank, maybe you need to have like 50,000 or 100,000 buy-in in in the Fed, and you receive some interest on that. 6%. 6%, right. And then, oh, oh, you're referring to that. Yeah, but the majority of the profits, they just go back to the treasury. 98% of them. Yeah. 98%. That's, that's, those, those are the hidden, um, banksters, 
Yeah, that's some that's some private entity, right? That uh, or ninety eight percent of the money goes to the federal government. Yeah, it's nonsense. Okay, going on. In M- in the MMT world, the c- the central bank is a government entity and, and mostly a distraction to the real business of government, which is fiscal policy. This is what we were talking about earlier, where the government deficit has way more to do with what's going on than whatever interest rate the central bank is coming up with. But if you consolidate the entities, you see that the real money printing is done by the treasury and that the interest rates are not constraining for government spending. True. So MMT basically thinks we should stop obsessing with interest rate changes and focus policy on fiscal policy, policy, which is the more powerful lever. Yep. The next term, sovereign currency issuer in MMT, means a country that doesn't peg its currency, has no foreign debt, is not resource constrained, has has diverse output base, etc. Now, I want to stop right here because I've never seen this extended definition for sovereign currency issuer. Have you? Uh, everything except for the diverse output base. The other things, yeah, don't pack your currency. No uh, borrowing in foreign currency. Um, okay, resource con- no resource constrained. I don't think that's a requirement for sovereign currency. Everyone is resource constrained because resources on planet Earth are limited. I don't know where he where he yeah. takes that from. Basically, sovereign currency issuer is the MMT equivalent of a household that is really really rich and won't likely go bankrupt, which is a useful concept and also. A pretty meaningless one since most countries can't just choose to be sovereign. I'm not quite sure what to make of this sentence. Well, I mean, what, what does he mean by ex- what does he mean by most countries can't just choose to be sovereign? Well, because like a, a small, insignificant country, he thinks like if you were to start your own new country. There'd be so much pressure around you and so much dependence on other economies that you you can't just be, you can be bullied can't around be sovereign. But I mean, I think that point is debatable. I think the IMF and entities like that they claim that countries can't be sovereign in their own currency for opportunistic reasons and not because it's a fact but rather because that allows them to exploit and shaft those countries. And force them into austerity. Exactly. Next word, or phrase, net financial assets, refers to the fact that when the government runs a deficit, it issues an asset to the private sector without a corresponding liability. This is to say that when a dollar is printed, it doesn't, that dollar doesn't have to come back in the same way, when a, when a bank creates a dollar, that dollar has to come back. In other words, it is a net financial asset. This has been the subject of much controversy over the years, as MMT people sometimes imply that a deficit is the only way for the private sector to net save. It is misleading at best and wrong at worst. Well, he and he discusses that uh, from time to time. It. it Basically, what it comes down to is the interpretation of the word net save or net yep. private savings, net financial assets. Why The reason why we find net financial assets to be an important uh, measure to look at is because of historical evidence that shows that whenever net financial assets uh, uh, decline, we see a depression and we've talked about that. We've seen uh, in the United States since its inception, there have been seven depressions and every single one of them, sorry, seven times the government has run a budget surplus and every single time it's been followed by, a, a sorry, six out of seven times it's been followed by a depression and the seventh time was the Great Recession of 2007, 2008. So that's why we think net private savings is important and that's why we look at it as a helpful indicator to predict recessions and or depressions. Going on. That's the operational part of MMT in a nutshell, but it doesn't end there. This is really just a warm-up for the entire purpose of the theory, which is political policy. 
If you believe all the above is right, which you actually shouldn't because, well, it's at least partly wrong, which he links to, and that might be a good source of further discussion, then you arrive at one conclusion. Only the government can provide us with full employment by deficit spending sufficiently and running a job guarantee. In other words, the job guarantee and government deficits are a necessary conclusion of the theoretical operational aspects. The two go hand in hand. Um, I know he linked to his other article, but I feel it's a little unfair that he doesn't that he makes this claim and doesn't back it up here. Well, he uh, he tends to write very short and concise articles, and he, he, he actually he he always makes a great effort to keep his articles concise, and he has linked to a very elaborate critique, which we can get into some other time. But I think uh, I I still maintain that a job guarantee and government deficits are a necessary condition for for a uh, thriving economy. Yeah, they're the logical conclusion. Yeah, they, they're necessary. They're not sufficient, but they're certainly necessary. With without them, we'll always have unemployment in some way, in one way or another, and we'll always uh, end up in austerity sooner or later. Or just constantly muddled through mild austerity, which is basically the entire state of the Western world these days. Yeah. So he ends this saying there are there are all blah, blah, blah. there are all sorts of peripheral. God damn it, Nima! I blame you for this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we, we finished off Dylan now. <laughs> There are all sorts of peripheral distractions and details here, and the MMT people will no doubt throw many hissy fits over this post. Um, That's true. Know, have you, have you and I, well, you and I haven't thrown hissy fits. You, you and I won't, but most uh, other MMTers will definitely throw hissy fits over yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that's pretty much it. If you want to email me with complaints about these, please reach me at colinroach7958225 at gmail.com. And then he also writes here, I deeply apologize if this is a real email address and someone has to deal with all the annoying MMT people. Well, I hope we're not annoying people. We're just interested in the topic. <laughs> and that's it. So yeah. any any thoughts on this uh, in terms well, of – I think it's, a, it's it definitely the primer is great, I think. You know, you, you can really see that he understands MMT uh, from his summary, right? Mm-hmm. And he has some very interesting further criticisms of it that he covers in a very long article, which we can get into some other time. But I think at least this gives you some sort of idea of what is, um, what is an educated criticism of MMT and, and what is just, just uh, Hit tripe. Pieces. For quota. Yeah, I mean those those yeah. two first articles they read like goddamn CNN or BuzzFeed or something. Yeah, yeah. or or like a, 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 an elementary school student, but I don't want to offend elementary school. Yeah, I think I could have done better than that in elementary school. Yeah, and unless there's anything else that we need to add here, I think we've covered it pretty well. This has been Amagi, hosted by myself, Nima Majur of EconomicsJunkie.com, and Dylan Moore of the Volitional Science Network, which you can find on YouTube. And we're, of course, graciously being hosted by the Think Liberty Network, which you can find at think-liberty.com. By the way, now part of beinglibertarian.com. Woohoo! <laughs> and uh, we thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.